today, home to school, and let's start by thinking about why are some children behind other children when starting school? We're just so let's quickly let's review what we've covered so far in the class. We've talked about what classroom English is, and we've looked at the differences between learning a first language and learning a second language. Then we looked at the ways that um, how social relations, being able to understand other people, is really at the basis of language. And then we looked at then the way that the brain works and how that, that facilitates learning language. And then we looked at other kind of uh, interactions, how interactions lead us to learn a language, as well as um, we looked at some specific adult to child interactions. And we know that the home, the home is a very successful place for learning language. Now, some children, when they, be, when they first start school, when they enter school, are behind other children when they start, okay? Why is that? Because again, most, when children begin school, most all children speak the language, okay? okay? Probably when you began elementary school, all of you spoke Korean. Of course, in this class, certainly all of you spoke Korean because you were all probably academically ahead when you started school, okay? But there are some children who are behind. And so why are some children uh, behind other children when starting school? And what differences are there between the homes of academically successful and unsuccessful children. And I want you to just think about that for a second, okay? With your partner, write a sentence or two with your ideas. It's okay to talk with your partner, share your ideas that you might have, or why, why you think some children might be happy. Okay. hearing this many words every week for five years on average, some less, some more. Okay? And from that, they then are able to produce on their own, on average, 2,500 words, okay, vocabulary. They're able to produce this many words. Now, of course, we remember children, children initiate conversations, children start conversations, okay, but at the same time, though, the parents probably talk more, use more words. So the children's hearing a great a large amount of input. Okay. Any questions about this? Questions? Are you confused? Is this confusing? This is just the, the, this is just we've recorded how many words children hear. Okay. So there's this book that was published called Meaningful Differences, and it was a study. The study was done over three years which is called a long, longitudinal study, where researchers recorded all the conversations in a home. Okay, and they found some amazing patterns. So they put microphones inside the homes. I think it was of like 300 homes. They put microphones in all the rooms, and they recorded all the conversations for three years. With few exceptions, the more parents talked to their children, the faster the children's vocabularies were growing, I think this is bad English, and the higher the children's IQ test scores at the age of three and later. So what this is saying here is that they found a correlation, a, a connection, a relationship between how much the, the parents talked, the quantity, how much the parents talked, and the children's IQ at age three, and the size of the children's vocabulary at age three. Uh, you know, Dave, I'm not really that excited about IQ. I don't think that that's really a great measurement. 
But again, still though, they were measuring children's vocabulary. So how much just the parents talk to the children? Quantity. The data also reveal that the most important aspect of children's language experience is its amount. The amount, the quantity, is very connected with the child's vocabulary. Okay, the size of the child's vocabulary and again the measurements of IQ test scores. Differences in the amount of cumulative experience. Cumulative means total. Okay, the total experience that the children had were strongly linked to differences in age three of the child's rates of vocabulary growth, vocabulary use, and general accomplishments, and strongly linked to differences in school performance at age nine. So notice here is that the amount that the parents are speaking at home, the quantity that parents are speaking at home, ends up affecting the child's vocabulary development, the use of the child's vocabulary at age three, but then also that this ends up correlating well with the child at age nine. Do you get that? No? Question? Do you understand the relationship here? Parents talk a lot. Children, parents talk a lot. Children have, let's say, higher IQ, larger vocabulary. Parents don't talk a lot. Parents have lower vocabulary. Okay, at age three. But not only at age three, we find that as the children progress is that these differences continue all the way to age nine. Maybe this will help kind of put it, let's imagine, and I'll come back to this, okay, is that, is that the children at age three, okay, and then at the children at age nine, they're, they're continuing, they're making, these, the, the amount that the parents are speaking affects the child's development much later into the future. Okay? Now, there were some very, there were quantitative differences between different kinds of homes, and they were looking at professional, working class and poverty level homes, and they did find that there was a large difference. This is on average, we're gonna look at these numbers more closely. This is just averages, okay, just the bell curve. Right? But they found that in the professional level homes, professional home would be, again, like a teacher or an engineer or an architect or a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. They're finding that on average, by the age of four, these children had heard on average 45 million words. 45 million words. Whereas children coming out of the poverty level homes had heard 13 million words. There's a big difference in the quantity, on average, on average. But then there were, also, there were also qualitative differences that they found in the homes. And these here, these are not, um, these are not connected to this, okay? These are not, but they did find some qualitative differences. They found that some parents talked with children, whereas other parents talked at children. Right now, Damon is being a bad teacher because I'm talking <laughs> at you. I'm not talking with you. Okay? Some parents did joint activities, participating in things together, involved them in tasks. Maybe they're folding clothes or cooking dinner or cleaning the house. They involved the children in the tasks and answered questions, were responsive. Again, we talked about before, parents being responsive to children in their questions. Other parents spent little time playing with their kids. Didn't involve them. Admonish them for interrupting and asking questions. Here, admonish is kind of like scold. Uh, stop bothering me. Stop interrupting me. Stop asking questions. Why do you ask so many questions? Oh, it's so annoying always asking so many questions, right? Okay? So they did find some qualitative differences. Big quantitative differences that were connected to social class. But then we also found some qualitative differences as well. And again then, when these children, when these children, when they enter into school, children make progress in school, but low academic performers, low academic performers, rarely become high academic performers over the course of their educational career. So notice what we're seeing here is that 
the interaction at home, the home environment, is kind of determining the child's future academic performance through elementary school, even into middle through middle school, even through high school. So the home environment, on average, there are outliers, there are exceptions, of course, but on average, that home environment is often, for the most part, determining the course of that child's educational academic career through high school, probably. I think there, there is research out there to suggest that. I haven't read that research yet. Okay. But we can look into the numbers a little more closely. So let's look here at, here we have poverty level, working class, and professional. Now which, which one has the highest average? Which one has the highest average in regards to, this is academic performance, okay, in school, A, B, C, D, and F. Which one has the highest performance on average? Professional. Professional. Which one has the lowest average? Okay, however, However, are some children from poverty level families performing at a high academic level? Are some children from the poverty level families performing at a high academic level? Yes. Okay, we have children that do perform at a high academic level coming from poverty households. The average is lowest. Okay, the average is lowest, but that doesn't mean that we don't have individuals that are performing at a high academic level. We even working class, some people, some children are performing at a high academic level, and at the professional, some children are performing at a high academic level. And we have children from the professional performing at a low academic level as well. Okay? So then we then look into well, what are the differences that are going on between these homes and these homes across across socioeconomic uh, boundaries or or categories. And let's think about let's think about school for a second. Okay, let's think about school. In school, talking is really important. So think about when you were in school. No, what's more important than talking? Okay, hearing, reading, and writing. Okay, particularly reading and writing is what probably really separates students. So children entering school in regards to speaking ability, children are all very close to each other. Okay, all children are able to speak and listen really well. But at the same time though is that school really doesn't measure your speaking ability. Okay? It's more about your, your, how large is your vocabulary. Right? If you have a large vocabulary, you can understand more things, so then you can do well uh, in class and in school. If you, uh, what was my next, my, I had the next point right there. Uh, if you, no, I forgot. Anyways. <clears throat> okay. So, what we found, though, is that Speaking becomes less important, and reading and writing become more important. Over, as this continues throughout the course of school. Research by Gordon Wells has found that the amount of time parents spent reading to their preschool children is key for sustained academic success. So notice, this is before school. This is preschool children. How much the parents read to their children was what determines their academic success upon entering school. When they enter school, the children enter at a high level, the children whose parents read to them. And again, we remember that that persists. And that is across boundaries. Parents who read to their children before elementary school have children that enter school at a high academic level because academically we, we evaluate children's reading, writing abilities increasingly. The children whose parents did not read to them enter school at a lower academic level and that persists as well. 
So I want you to very quickly explain now, what does this mean? Explain the researcher's findings in your own words. So now we have a box there. It's okay to talk with your partner. I want you to, what I just talked about here, I want you to put it into your own words, please. Hopefully you've taken good notes, you've filled up a good portion of the page, and now I want you to put it into your words. You have three minutes. participation during these conversation times. That's why I have these.
this again. Now, you have these very large, again, these are just averages. So you might, you have poverty level children who are hearing 45 million words. Okay? You have working class children who are hearing 45 million words. You have professional children who are hearing 13 million words. Okay? These are, these are just averages. Right? What's the unifying what, what do you, which one of these do you think translates into higher academic performance? Probably the one on the left. Did joint activity, some kind of joint activity, what kind of joint activity do you think is a really important joint activity that gives us many words and relates well to academic success? Book is not activity. What's the activity? Reading. Reading. Reading with your child. That would be a joint activity that relates, that ends up giving a lot of big quantity of words, ends up translating well into academic success, because again, the structure of the educational system, the structure of the educational system is speaking is less important Reading and writing is more important. Again, the research by Gordon Wells found it's just how much time, the amount of time parents spend reading is the key for sustained, sustained, continued, continued academic success. It came down to how much they read, read with each other. So how can we use this information as teachers then? How can we use this? Any ideas? Let us then copy the parent-child model of parents reading to the children. Is that if this is what if this is what is allowing children to sustain long-term academic success, then let's try to copy this model. Again, chances are, chances are. These kids, percentage-wise, they're just going to continue along this line. Okay, that's what this is. What happens? The educational system fails the children. Okay, we fail the children constantly. It's okay. It's, it's a it's an ecological problem. It's not just it's not the teacher's fault. Okay, but what I but but anyway, <clears throat> let's copy the model that leads to academic success. Okay? And why is reading so important? Let's think about why. Why is reading so important? And I want you to keep in mind that this, I, again, my class is about English, okay, and classroom English, and how can we bring English into the classroom to help children perform well academically. But this is also for Korean. I mean, you are first, first you are Korean teachers, and first you want to help your children with their, with their Korean language. Okay, so reading to your children and students in Korean is extremely important for their academic success. More important than reading to your children in English. Okay, first reading to your children in Korean. So bring Korean books into the classrooms. Okay, the process of reading, getting children to be lifelong readers. Reading in English is a wonderful way to help your students enjoy the time they spend learning English and develop positive emotions toward English. Remember, we talked about. Remember, we talked about how how connected these emotions, our emotional our emotional state, is very connected to our learning process, very connected to our language acquisition process. We need to get positive emotions 
going on in this process. So just something, we have to make it enjoyable. It has to be something that's enjoyable. We know, what do we know? We know that parents who read to their children before elementary school have children who succeed in school and continue to succeed. Okay, let's try to bring that in. First Korean, then English, but hey, maybe this is a way we can make English a little more enjoyable. Reading to children is so important to lifelong learning that it must not be delayed. Okay, reading, read, and I'm talking about Korean here. Reading to the children in Korean. Also English, they have to learn English. First Korean. And the reason why is because it connects to lifelong learning. Children who read are people, are become ch people who learn more over the course of their life. Reading to children create independent readers, writers, and thinkers. We want, we want children to be independent readers, where children read on their own time. Not because the teacher said they have to read, but because they want to read. Because people who read more, write more, think more. Children need teachers to read to them simply for the enjoyment of reading. Not for teaching, but just for the enjoyment of reading. Because again, if we're doing it just for the enjoyment, then we have positive emotional associations. Makes us want to do it more. Oh, okay, I'll go back, sorry. You can put it, put it in your own words. Put it in your own words. Don't just copy my words. Just for the enjoyment, not for teaching. Not for teaching. Parents don't read to their kids to teach them Korean or to teach them English. They read to their children because children like parents to read them a storybook. It's an emotional, social connection. <clears throat> Why is reading a... Oops. Okay, why is reading important? Reading is important because it provides a greater amount and variety of vocabulary than spoken language. Let's think about this. All children, whether they're poverty, working class, or professional class, all children when they enter school have good speaking ability. All children have good speaking ability. But in school, we don't measure the speaking ability, we measure their vocabulary size, right? The size of their vocabulary. How much can, how many different words can they understand? All the children speak well. We have the vocabulary to speak well. Now our spoken vocabulary is much smaller. It's between 2,500 to 5,000 words is our spoken vocabulary. 2,500 to 5,000 words. But our reading and writing vocabulary is about 10 to 20,000 words. So it's double or four times as large or even more. Okay, and this is why reading is important. Reading provides a larger vocabulary, exposes us to more words than we hear in daily life. It takes children beyond daily experience and exposes them to rare words. For example, my son, oh man, I forgot. Jam Suham. Okay. My son knows the knows Jam Suham. Jam Suham? Okay, my son knows. Has my son ever seen a Jam Suham? Has, has my son ever ridden on a Jam Suham? No. How does he know a Jam Suham? Because of book. Okay, the book exposes children to vocabulary that they will not be exposed to in daily life. Daily life, I never say, hey, let's go get the jamsuham and go to the store. <laughs> right? You see what I'm saying here is that books expose children to a wider vocabulary. Now how? How does he understand jamsuham? Think back to when we talked about language, language acquisition. How do we mean, how do we understand the word jamsuham? How does he understand that? He's seen what? 
How? <laughs> pictures. That's the great thing about children's books. Children's books have pictures. So then the, that code, that speech code, gets connected to the picture, to the image. And that's how he understands it. Okay? So, exposes children to rare words. Cham Su Hum is a rare word. It's not a difficult word. Not a difficult word, but it's a rare word. Uncommon. Research has shown that past the fourth grade, the number of words a person knows depends on how much they read. How many words a person knows after fourth grade largely just depends on how much they read. People who read more, people who read a lot, have a vocabulary about four times the size of those who rarely or never read. People who read more are exposed to a wider vocabulary. And again, you know, past the fourth grade, and we see past fourth grade, right? Reading and writing become more, become more important. Speaking is not really evaluated in our educational system. Do we understand why this is the case? Get it? Get the ideas here? So what are rare words? Rare words are not difficult words. Words that are not often used in spoken language, such as color. Okay? I might say, um, look at the clock. Okay? Look at the clock. I don't say, look at the round white clock with black borders. <laughs> with a black border, okay? So in our spoken language, I would say, look at the clock. But in written language, written language includes many descriptions, such as color, shape, size words, strong descriptive words. These are rare words, words we don't use in spoken language. Not difficult words, but just we don't use them a lot when we speak. But they are important because we measure your knowledge of those words in school. Children's books contain the words, context, the story often creates a context, a situation. And we talked about that. Remember how important that context is, context is to language acquisition? And visual connections, right? Our sensor, our senses, how we see the, the world or our, our yeah, internalization of the world through our body that allow for acquisition of these words. This is why books are so important for children. They contain the rare words they need, but that do not occur enough in daily life. I think I already made that point. And here we've got a list here, a number of rare, rare words per 1,000 words. So if we look at just a uh, adult to child conversation, this is when the child is six months old, the number of rare words is 9.3 for every 1,000 words. So 1,000 words, 9.3 of them will be rare words. Adult to child at three years of age, 9.0. Wow, even becomes fewer, fewer rare words. 10 years of age, 11.7. Adult to adult conversation, 17.3. These, these are not difficult words, just rare words. Okay, television is here. But they look at a children's book. Children's book has even more rare words than even television. Of course, we get scientific papers, and these words are often difficult words. But you can still see that we get these rare, rare words. And again, children whose parents read to them, and we'll, we'll look at this more next week, but children, father reads to their child. What's that child's feeling? Child's reading a story to his son. What's the feeling that the child has? It's a good feeling, a feeling of warmth, a feeling of comfort, a feeling of love. That connection, that association ends up being connected with the event of reading. So the child enjoys reading. The reading exposes them to more rare words. Rare words are very connected with their performance at school. Their knowledge of rare words connects with their performance at school. And it connects with when they start school. And if they enjoy reading, they continue through school to read and learn more rare words. 